thank you for having me. Um, so I'm Philip, I work for Nesta. Um, you've heard a bit about Nesta. Um, ooh, right, okay, so uh, what is innovation? So I work for an innovation foundation. And um, when I go to my friends for dinner and they say, uh, what do you do? Um, it takes me quite a while to explain it because innovation means different things to different people. Um, have you got post-it notes? Have you got post-it notes? Can we give everybody some post-it notes? Okay, so what I want you all to do in silence, sorry, um, is write down on one post-it note an innovation that has changed your life. And just because if I don't do this, you will all say iPhones, I'm going to say an iPhone. iPhones changed my life. Um, it changed my life because I get lost all the time in London. And since I got an iPhone, I know where I am, and I can quickly get my Google Maps up and find out where I'm supposed to be. So iPhone is an innovation that absolutely changed my life. I now get lost far less frequently in London. Does that make sense? So write down an innovation that changed your life. Any innovation, just an innovation that you think changed your life, yeah. That your life would be different if you didn't have it. It's easy. You can't use iPhones, I've already got it. <laughs> Larry, by the way, is already my best friend here because he said, are you Philip's dad? Because he said that on the photo I looked younger. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. <laughs> It's only taken last week, that photo. Okay, who's got one? Yeah. Flushing toilets. Uh, you're brilliant, Isaac. I've run this exercise a hundred times, and sewage or toilets is always the first thing. Thank you, Isaac. <laughs> uh, always. It never fails. That's amazing. It's happened again. Um, what did you have, Tom? TV, good, good innovation. Who else? Computers. Computers. Google, Facebook, yes. Sorry. The internet. the internet, the internet. We invented the internet. That's what British people tell themselves. Um, <laughs> sorry? Search engines, yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyone got anything that isn't technology? Yeah. Language, ooh. Religion, crikey, <laughs> smiling, I'm not sure that's an innovation, I don't know. Is that an innovation? Okay, okay, any others, any non, sorry? Glasses, you don't wear glasses. Uh, I'm reading glasses, okay. <laughs> Larry's going to be trouble. Um, uh, any others? Any others? Way to live with nature. Interesting. That's a good one. Okay. Innovation means lots of different things to lots of different people. It is technology, but it can also mean things that aren't technology. Um, like, smiling. like smiling. But this idea of social innovation is sort of slightly more complicated. So if innovation is all of those things, in inventions, creations, new ways of doing things, what's a social innovation? What do we mean by social innovation? So could you again, just in silence, write down on your post-it note an example of a social innovation? Could you use a different post-it note? Use a different post-it note. Make sure you've written these down, because I want you to stick them over here. No pressure, Isaac, but I'm counting on you to give us the first one. Okay. Has everyone got one? Okay. Everyone got a social innovation? Isaac, go on. Um, I'm not sure of the specific words, but that basically the code of law He's amazing. It just, thank you. Tax is what I usually get first. 
Um, but code of law is brilliant. That's a great one. Who else has got one? One from the back. I haven't heard. Uh, yes? Banking. Yeah. Very popular in Europe at the moment. Um, <laughs> any from over here? Facebook as a social innovation. Yeah. Who else? Kindergarten. So nursery schools. Yeah. Insurance. Insurance. That's a good one too. Cafes. Where did that come from? There. Brilliant. There. <laughs> Oliver. Prison. That's fantastic. I haven't had that one before. That's a great example of a social innovation. Um, look, we can spend a long time on this exercise, but I haven't got long. The thing, I th prison's a great one. I'm going to use that in future. Um, does anyone know who this is? There's no reason why you would, right? Um, this is uh, a guy called Fleming. Um, I, always, I like to tell the story of Alexander Fleming. Um, he was a scientist, and he did an amazing thing. He discovered penicillin. So this is the guy uh, that essentially discovered antibiotics, which has transformed lots of people's lives. And I tell his story for two reasons. I think it's a great example of a social and a scientific innovation coming together. Um, but more importantly, his story tells us about how innovations happen. Uh, so what happened is he's a very messy scientist. And he basically left all of his stuff in his laboratory and went on holiday for six weeks to France. Those were the days when he used to go on holiday for six weeks in the UK. Uh, and when he came back, in one of the dishes was, uh, he'd been experimenting with bacteria. The, ba the bacteria had died around a mold. And that mold was the penicillin, uh, was, was the, uh, 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 the antibiotic, right? That's the bacteria killer that he found. Now, lots of people use his story to say that innovations are accidental, that they come up by chance. But actually, I use his story differently, because Fleming was embarked on a process of scientific discovery. He was trying to understand how bacteria worked. And what he did is he observed something that had happened by chance, and then translated it into an innovation that changed everybody's lives. So innovations come about partly by chance, but also through discovery through a systematic process of testing and adaptation. And it's as true for social innovations as it is for technology innovations. So of course, iPhones, we need a newer photo, don't we, of an iPhone 5. iPhones and other technological innovations are examples of things that transform our lives. They're new discoveries uh, that go on to change the world. But there are lots of different types of innovation. The Harlem Children's Zone, it was great to hear somebody say kindergarten. The Harlem Children's Zone is an innovation in how they do schooling in New York that's transformed the lives of thousands and thousands of kids growing up in one of the toughest neighborhoods. Carpets were an amazing innovation. Carpets used to be, um, in Europe at least, only for the very richest people. And then somebody invented a way of making it uh, an automated process to create a tufted carpet, and suddenly we all have carpets made our lives much nicer. Skateboards is an example of a user innovation. No company created skateboards. Surfers, who didn't have surf, if there's, any, there's a movie about this, it's great, um, put wheels on little surfboards in, uh, uh, and in one summer in California when all the swimming pools had gone dry, they used them to kind of skateboard up and down empty swimming pools. So user innovation, service innovation, like new forms of banking, um, frugal innovation, uh, the Akash tablet computer there in the middle. And there are lots of models for how you create innovation. This is some of them I won't go through. They basically all involve some kind of funnel where you have lots of ideas and then you go through a systematic process to get down to fewer, better ideas. And this is the one, this is the model of innovation that we'll be working through with you. This was developed by Nesta and the Young Foundation a few years ago. Um, and what this tries to articulate is that innovation is a process. Um, it's not linear, so don't think of this as a, a line. You start at one end and you work your way through. Um, instead, it's the reason it's a, a, a spiral is it's meant to be an iterative process. So you start by exploring opportunities and challenges, understanding the issues that you're trying to get to grips with. And I'm going to talk to you about some of that in a moment generating ideas, developing and testing those ideas, putting them into practice, making the case for them to be better than the thing that you're, uh, uh, is happening currently, 
delivering and implementing, growing and scaling, taking something from a, a small idea that's working in one place to spreading it across a country. And then ultimately, what we want to do is change systems, particularly in social innovation. I think it's also really important, um, this point, that innovations give rise to other innovations. So I use the iPhone as the example of the thing that changed my life. Um, this is the iPod. They're very old-fashioned now, right? But people remember iPods before we had iPhones. The thing about iPods, which I think is interesting, <coughs> is there was nothing new in an iPod at all. Apple didn't invent anything new. There was no discovery, no invention. iPods were essentially an accumulation of other people's innovations. The Sony Walkman was the thing that really was uh, uh, new in listening to music. Back in the 80s, that transformed the idea of music from something that you had to do in a static environment with other people to something you could do personally and on the move. MPEGs, the technology for compressing music into a digital format, was created in Germany. Um, and so on. There's sort of, you know, the different models of trying to use these technologies to create personal listening devices. Um, what's interesting is people think that the iTunes Store was the innovation that Apple did. But of course, the iTunes Store was just a copy of Napster. In fact, I'd argue the only thing that Apple did that was new with iTunes was they were the first company that got us to give our credit cards to them. The first online company that, that, that persuaded human beings to say, yes, of course you can have my credit card details and I don't have to re-enter anything when I spend money with you. That was a real innovation. The point here is that <coughs> innovations give rise to other innovations. They build off each other. But the way that we innovate is changing. So innovation used to be about discovery in big laboratories, um, lots of scientists working in the Bell Labs or uh, the Bio Institute in Germany. And of course, it's changing now. Open innovation models, lots of big companies like Cisco don't do innovation anymore. What they do is buy companies, smaller companies that do innovation. Um, open innovation, I've already talked about the skateboard, but mountain biking and BMXing, similarly, no company invented those. Users created them. Basically, people who wanted to do something uh, and just you know, got on with it themselves. And social innovation, which is why we're here, is a new form of innovation that's um, uh, gathering lots of traction. So look, this is a whistle-stop tour through innovation. Charlie Ledbetter is one of the guys that we work with um, a lot in the uh, UK. He's an associate of Nesta, worth reading some of his material. And he has this quote that innovation is invariably a cumulative, collaborative activity in which ideas are shared, tested, refined, developed, and applied. Innovation isn't about geniuses sat in a room thinking up ideas. It almost never happens that way. One of my... Um, Colleagues that I work with in the UK is fond of saying, none of my ideas got better because I kept them to myself. Okay, innovation is about collaboration. It's about sharing, it's about getting feedback, and it's about being open. And business, as much as social innovators, businesses are increasingly realizing this. We haven't got a great deal of time, so I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but there are different types of social uh, or public innovation. Um, some are about improving current systems, working within the institutions we already have, and others are more disruptive. They're about transforming um, the way that we solve problems. I'll just use one example to illustrate this chart. A type of improvement or efficiency innovation is just getting better fire engines, right? One way to prevent people dying from fires in the homes is to get better fire engines. And since we had those as fire engines about 60 years ago in the UK, we have now got much better fire engines. They're better at putting fires out, they get there quicker, they're safer for firemen. But another way of preventing deaths by fire is inventing fire alarms and putting a low-cost, ubiquitous technology in everybody's home that makes a noise when smoke is detected. And that saves more lives. It's more disruptive. It's a different type of innovation. What's interesting is they answer different questions. So one question is, 
how can we get better fire engines? And another question is, how can we get people out of their homes quicker before the fire engine ever gets there? So the question you ask often leads to the innovation that you get. So what is a social innovation? Well, we wrote a book called The Open Book of Social Innovation. You can get it for free online, and it's got this rather long description in it. But innovations that are social, both in their ends and their means. New ideas, products, services, and models that simultaneously meet social needs and create new social relationships or collaborations. By the way, I think that point earlier that we were discussing about innovations can be an old idea applied to a new setting is really important. It doesn't always have to be brand new to the world. But innovations that are both good for society and enhance society's capacity to act. That's a bit of the definition I feel quite passionate about. I think truly social innovations are ones that enhance society's capacity to act. It's a whistle-stop tour of innovation, and I can do two days just on that. But I'm around over the next two days and happy to talk to you about it, um, if that's helpful. I just want to talk a bit about prompts for social innovation. Why? What, you know, what prompts you to come up with an idea? What, um, uh, what triggers you to act? And the reason why this is important is because these aren't accidental. You can, we say this all the time to public bodies and to governments, that the very best governments, the very best organizations, prompt themselves to innovate. And many innovations come from challenges. They come from problems. They come from unmet needs. And there's a whole range of different uh, uh, ways that might manifest itself. In the UK and in Europe, we have a financial crisis at the moment. Um, our public services have lost a lot of money, and that's prompting a lot of innovation. Um, you can also have complaints is a good trigger for innovation. When people are dissatisfied with something, and that can translate itself into political mandates. Often you'll get quite a lot of innovation comes in when uh, pol political leadership changes. But innovation can also come from opportunities, can also be prompted by opportunities. And that can be about new evidence, new theories. We're understanding a lot more about how the brain works. We're understanding a lot more about how psychology uh, and behavioral sciences work. And that's prompting a lot of innovation in the UK at the moment. Technology, you know, the fact that we now have the internet and digital technologies is prompting huge amounts of innovation, social innovation. Um, I still think we've got a long way to go. But the point there is that it's not always negative and about challenges. It can also be about opportunities as a trigger for innovation. And where you really want to get to is well-defined challenges and opportunities. And this is an, a part of the process that people often skip over, that they leap straight to solutions. But actually, it's worth spending quite a bit of time on understanding your challenges and opportunities well. Um, and I won't go through all the methods here, but there are a lot, of, a lot of different techniques that you can use to reframe, um, to deepen your understanding of the challenge or the opportunity that you're trying to exploit. So I've got a minute. I'll just talk about a few examples if I can. Are there any designers here? Any service designers? OK, one, two, a couple of service designers. Because a lot of what you see in social innovation is actually about applying the techniques of observation and insight generation from service design. It's about understanding people's lived experience. And it's been a really powerful part of the changes we're seeing in the UK and across Europe about how social innovation is developing is we're taking those lessons from design and applying them to social problems. Does anyone know what that is? The Swiffer. Yeah? People know the Swiffer story? So the Swiffer, is it Procter & Gamble? I think it is Procter & Gamble. Was it the Swiffer? Yeah. So this was a, a company that um, basically produces mops and other cleaning products for the home who some time ago had realized that they weren't really selling any more mops, you know, mops for cleaning floors, right? So they set some designers on to um, figuring out what they could do to sell new products, develop new products that they could sell to basically mums who were cleaning their houses, right? The Swiffer story is interesting because what the designers did is watched people using mops for tens of thousands of hours 
pause on that. Imagine watching videos of people cleaning their floors for tens of thousands of hours. Do you have that? Imagine that's your job. Your job is to go into work every day and watch videos of people cleaning the floor. And what they discovered, and I think this is interesting because it tells you something about insight. The insight they generated, the insight they came to, was that people spent more time cleaning their mop than they spent cleaning the floor. <laughs> right? And that's a truism, right? If you're mopping, then a lot of the time you spend cleaning the bloody thing. And so what a Swiffer does is solves that problem. Because you clean the floor and then you rip the thing off the bottom and you throw it away. So it's a more efficient way of cleaning the floor. They sell loads of these things. I, I'm not a, it's not an advert for Swiffers, although you should get one. They're very good. Um, actually, the point is that observation is an important part of generating insights. And it's an important part of how social innovation happens. This is, uh, so this was a room. It's a bit smaller than this room. Um, and there was a piece of paper running all the way around the wall. Um, it was a project which we supported in uh, the UK, um, uh, which was looking at troubled families. So these were families who um, their parents didn't work, their children, they had drug problems, and their children were not doing well at school. In the UK, we have a small number of these families which cause huge amounts of problems. And what the researchers that were working with this family did was mapped 18 years of public sector interventions in that family's life. So every appointment with a doctor, every meeting with a teacher, every, every time the police were called to their house, every time they went to hospital. And they mapped 18 years worth of interventions around the wall. It was an incredibly powerful thing to do. And of course, what they realized is the family was no better off after 18 years of the public services trying to help them than they were at the start. And that led to a, a whole set of innovations about how they support families in crisis um, in that part of the UK. But an incredibly detailed piece of work to understand their lived experience. You don't have to spend that much time. There are lots of techniques <coughs> excuse me, to get there much quicker. And this is a set of cards which uh, I think that IDO developed cards, these ones. Um, which enable you quite quickly to uh, adopt personas and to challenge ideas and generate insights about the problems you're trying to solve. And this was a project which we ran in Reading where um, we trained uh, staff working in a children's center actually to do interviews with the parents of those children to try and understand how they could improve their services better. They're just a few, oh sorry, they're just a few of the ways in which you can use some of these techniques to get deeper into understanding the challenge or the opportunity that you're trying to explore. Now, I'm going to leave it there. And who am I handing over to? Um, Miri. Miri. Um, but we'll come back and have a chance to work with some of these ideas later. Okay, thank you. <laughs>